So uh, I'm going to jump into the program because Paula Hammond is the next speaker. It would be awkward for her to introduce herself, so I'm going to introduce her for her. Um, so Paula's name will be familiar to some of you who might have seen a recent episode of the PBS show Nova, where some of her work was featured. She'll be familiar to others of you. Uh, because she was named one of the top 100 material scientists of the last decade. I know Paula because she's a colleague of mine here in the Koch Institute. Her laboratory is right upstairs from me. As I mentioned, she's the David H. Koch Professor of Engineering. And Paula is a material scientist and chemical engineer. And her work, like Angie's, uh, covers a great range from microelectronics to making soldiers safer. Uh, and increasingly to medical applications and especially cancer. Um, Paula uses material science and polymer science to develop new ways of delivering drugs, um, conventional drugs, combinations of drugs, and new types of drugs. And she'll describe how she does that uh, and the promise of that approach uh, in her presentation. She's been um, recognized by many awards uh, and honors over the course of her career uh, and I think of note, as I mentioned, she was named um, one of the TEAL innovators uh, by the Department of Defense uh, in their ovarian cancer program. And I thought I would just cite from the website um, the criterion that uh, led to that award. The um, TEAL Innovator Award supports a visionary individual, highly recognized in her field, to apply her most creative vision to ovarian cancer research or patient care. Paul Hammond. Thank you so much, Tyler, for that wonderful introduction. And again, I really appreciate the chance to have this particular audience here today because we are learning from you, but we'd like to hear more from you as we move through the day. Um, as Tyler mentioned, as a TIL innovator, one of, one of the criteria is that uh, there's someone who's coming from outside the field of ovarian cancer uh, to act within it. So I will describe to you the technologies that we've worked on and what we've learned from them and how we're now applying them toward ovarian cancer. In my own lab, uh, we work with uh, nanoparticles. Uh, these are actually tiny things, and you heard uh, an excellent introduction to nanotechnology from my, my friend Angie. Uh, these are tiny nanoparticles which can actually traverse through the bloodstream and essentially seek out tumors embed in those tumors and there, thereby deliver our medication. Now, what we are taking advantage of when we use a nanoparticle are a few different phenomena. One of them is the fact that as tumors grow, they grow very rapidly uh, and they're developing their vasculature, their blood vessels, very rapidly. Uh, because of that, those blood vessels will often have defects <coughs> in them, holes often the size of uh, tens of nanometers to 100 nanometers or so. So if we have a nanoparticle in that size range, it can go through the bloodstream, and in the healthy uh, parts of the body, it won't go anywhere. But when it gets to the tumor, it will actually get taken up through those leaks into the tumor tissue itself. And we take advantage of that. I call it the pinball machine effect. You get it in there, and it gets stuck. And while it's looping around, it can actually deliver therapeutics before it comes out again. Now, uh, we can also encapsulate inside the nanoparticle a range of different therapeutics. And this includes everything from uh, the traditional chemotherapy drugs like cisplatin and doxorubicin to nucleic acids I'll talk a little bit about today, uh, such as siRNA, proteins, and other uh, biologically derived therapeutic materials. Uh, for this system to work, the nanoparticle has to get through the bloodstream without being taken up by cells that are designed to essentially eliminate bad matter in the body. Uh, these uh, immune cells that reside in our bloodstream will recognize something that is foreign and make sure that it's eliminated. We have to avoid that, so we need to have a kind of outer shell that essentially to the cells looks just like water. So a very hydrated material is used at the very outside of this nanoparticle to fool the cells into allowing it to go through the bloodstream and get to the tumor. And on top of that, we need to have some way of targeting that nanoparticle specifically to the tumor that we want to take up this chemotherapeutic. And so uh, we'll look for 
uh, things that cancer cells have that other cells don't, that they express on their surfaces. And this includes specific receptors that a number of cancer cells just happen to have that will allow us to create a molecule that binds to that receptor and therefore allows it to attach to the tumor cells. So in short, we have something that will encapsulate our chemotherapy molecules, shown here in yellow, and uh, protect them from the rest of the body uh, with this hydrated shell. And then we might attach these uh, little ligands to the very edge of the nanoparticle that will allow tumor cells to take up the nanoparticles, even though other healthy cells will not bother this system. So that's the general idea of a nanoparticle. Now in our lab, one of the things we've been very interested in doing is addressing drug resistance. And uh, Mike gave a, a wonderful introduction to the, the challenges that recurrence and resistance to cisplatin and doxorubicin, some of the most common uh, chemotherapy drugs, uh, have in uh, ovarian cancer in particular. And uh, the reason that these systems are able to resist the drug is that tumor cells are essentially they're a disease of gene dysregulation. So they have genes which uh, are essentially a little different. And some of those genes actually produce proteins that help tumor cells survive chemotherapy. So we can think of these as helper genes for the tumor. And these are helper genes that we would love to turn off. If we could turn off the helper genes, then when we deliver our chemotherapy agent, it would be effective. And this would not only uh, allow us to uh, eliminate some of the recurrence, which happens, because recurrence is due to uh, cells that have survived the first onslaught, but it can also help us to address any uh, resistant tumor cells that occur. Uh, if we can turn off the appropriate genes and make the tumors more susceptible to chemotherapy. So, how do we do this? How do we turn it off? Well, uh, there is short interfering RNA, siRNA for short. It's a nucleic acid that's also produced naturally in our body. But siRNA is a way that the body has of turning off a specific gene. Now, if we can take advantage of this as well, then what we can do is uh, understanding the genetics of ovarian cancer cells from the work of people like Dr. Mike Beer. We can then say, if we understand what gene is enabling this cell to survive, let's generate siRNA that will block that cancer cell gene and essentially prevent the helper protein from being produced. If we can do this effectively and at the same time, or at a very short but later time, introduce chemotherapy, we can greatly address resistant tumors, which is to a large extent what we're dealing with with recurrent uh, ovarian cancer, especially in advanced serous ovarian cancer. Now, one of the reasons we haven't been doing this already is that it's difficult to deliver siRNA. It turns out that uh, for a number of reasons, it's very delicate, it breaks down very rapidly in the body, um, and it's also got a very strong negative charge, uh, which prevents it from interacting with cells, whether we want them to or not. It's hard to get them inside tumor cells. So what we are actually doing is packaging siRNA in a nanoparticle by using the fact that siRNA is naturally negatively charged. And uh, all of you remember, you know, plus and minus attract. Well, we use that same principle to build up alternating layers in our work. So we actually have a technique called layer by layer assembly. And the idea is that we can take a surface and it may have some initial charge on it. And we can absorb onto the surface something that's oppositely charged. So if we have a minus surface, we can absorb something positive, And then we can absorb something negative, And then something positive. And layer by layer, we can build up a very thin film. When we're doing this with our system, we generate nanometer scale layers. And it turns out that the positively and negatively charged things that we can introduce can range a great deal from uh, macromolecules that we make in lab to natural things that come from the body, like proteins and siRNA. Since siRNA is negatively charged, we can make siRNA our negatively charged material and layer it with any sort of natural, positively charged material and make thin films that can package our siRNA. And what's nice about this is that we can do this with multiple different kinds of siRNA. So we have choices and we can incorporate several different uh, materials. 
Now, we want to do this on a nanoparticle. And what's nice about this is that we can take a nanoparticle as the core, and in this tiny particle, we can load a chemotherapy drug. So it can be doxorubicin or cisplatin. Platinum is one of the uh, key uh, chemotherapeutics of choice for ovarian cancer. We can put that on the inside of this nanoparticle and absorb on the outside those layers that contain siRNA. We can introduce more siRNA by introducing more layers. And finally, we can end with a, a final layer. And that final layer, it needs to be hydrated, right? And it needs to give us that ability to allow the nanoparticle to go through the bloodstream without being recognized by the immune cells. And finally, we hope that that outer layer will also specifically bind to the tumor cells if we design it so that it has the appropriate ligands that will attach to it. So here's what building these materials looks like sort of in our lab. Um, on the lower left, you can see an electron micrograph. And you might be able to see that there's a core in the middle that looks kind of rigid. And then you see this soft, fluffy, thin layer on the outside. These are several layers that contain siRNA. And uh, when we build it, uh, we can measure the charge going back and forth from minus to plus to minus to plus. And we put down more and more layers, we get more and more siRNA. And what's nice about this is we have unusually high amounts of siRNA that we can get into this tiny nanoparticle package as much as 3,000 copies of sRNA for a single layer. And that means that we are, have enough to have some sort of therapeutic effect. Now, we've got the sRNA on the nanoparticle. We also want to make sure that the nanoparticle is going to target those tumor cells. And the outer layer that we chose to use is a naturally occurring polysaccharide called hyaluronic acid. Some of you may have seen cosmetics that use hyaluronic acid. And some of you may actually take hyaluronic acid, which you can buy in the drugstore, uh, for health reasons. It's uh, a naturally occurring polysaccharide, but it turns out that there are certain tumor cells that overexpress a receptor that binds that polysaccharide. And for that reason, when we use that as our outer layer, um, we can actually get a large amount of accumulation in tumors. So this is a tumor histology section. And what we've done is we've labeled all of the cells with blue nuclei, so we have blue should be everywhere here, but where we blend colors, you see um, a, a combination. Then we have labeled the CD44 receptor, that's the receptor that binds our nanoparticle, and it turns out that all of these core cells that are in the middle, these are the tumor cells, and the outer are the stroma that line the tumor. We have it lit up all the way. A lot of these are expressing the CD44. And when we label our nanoparticles green, you see that they are accumulating in the same spot. So this is the same image looking at it through different channels. And we can see in the combination image that the nanoparticles are getting into the tumor cells, which is exactly what we want to do. Thanks, Mark. Um, and it turns out that this works in vivo. When we look at an animal model with mice that have tumors on their backs, and we look at nanoparticles that don't have the special layer that binds, we see that uh, this on the left is the tumors being labeled, they glow. And on the right, instead of uh, imaging the tumors, we're imaging where the nanoparticle went. It goes everywhere with a lot in the, in the liver. However, with our targeted nanoparticle, we see that um, when we look, we get more in the tumor. Uh, and even though there's some accumulation in other places like the liver, the amount is much greater, and for that reason, we can have a much greater therapeutic effect. So we know how to build these nanoparticles. Uh, we decided to test them. So this is, again, just a reminder that the nanoparticle can contain a chemotherapeutic in the core, siRNA wrapped around it, and then this outer layer that is stealth but binds to the tumor cell. Now, in our first example, we decided we uh, looked at a triple negative breast cancer model, and then we moved to an ovarian model. So I'll give you these two examples. Um, in the first example, uh, we were learning about how to target, so we chose a very simple one. We chose an siRNA that actually allows tumor cells to pump out the chemotherapy drug as it comes in. It's kind of wild how these tumor cells survive, but they have several mechanisms. This is one of them push it out like a, a baby spitting out medicine, okay? So in this case, it's called the MRP1 pump. And uh, what we decided to do was knock down the pump 
and in the core incorporate the chemotherapy drug, which was doxorubicin. And we uh, injected mice intravenously three times during their treatment. So in this case, when we uh, examine these systems, on the top, we have the combination nanoparticle. And on the bottom, we have an untreated mouse. So you can see that the tumor is growing very rapidly in the untreated mouse. In the middle, we have just doxorubicin. And just doxorubicin slows the rate of growth of the tumor, but the tumors are still growing because these tumor cells are spitting it out. Now, at the top, what we can see is that the tumors, rather than getting bigger, are on average actually getting smaller over time. And this plot actually shows you that compared to all of the other systems, uh, the combination therapy actually shows a decrease in the tumor rather than an increase, which is exactly what we want. We want to shrink those tumors. So now that we understand the mechanism, we're moving to ovarian targets. And this is the work that we're doing today. Uh, we're looking at uh, specific gene targets that are relevant to ovarian cancer. One of the things that interests us is that P53 is a gene that is the guardsman of uh, the cell. It's a gatekeeper gene. It knows how to detect DNA damage. And when it sees DNA damage, it makes a decision. Should we save this cell using DNA repair? Or should we allow this cell to die because its existence could harm the rest of the body? This is how this suppresses tumors. However, in a number of tumors, and cancer types, P53 is suppressed or mutated. And it turns out that uh, this is true for many tumors, but for high-grade ovarian, almost all have this P53 guardsman uh, mutation in which the P53 is not working the way it should. So uh, we're looking at ways to address that. It turns out that uh, for cancer cells in which the P53 guardsman is not working, uh, when you deliver a DNA damaging agent uh, to these kinds of cells, uh, they still survive the presence of the DNA damage agent. Let's say it's doxorubicin or a cisplatin, a platinum agent. They still survive it, even though if P53 were there, it, we would have regulated cell death. And the reason that it's still working for them is that there's another gene called MK2 that in these genetically modified tumor cells allows the tumor cells to grow and divide because they actually undergo repair. So MK2 ends up being a gene that enables P53 mutated tumor cells. All right, so if we knock out MK2, we can then allow these cells to undergo the cell death that we have as our target. This work is a collaboration with Michael Yaffe, who's a fellow Koch Institute uh, faculty member and a biologist, systems biologist. And in this work, we examined whether or not tumor cells that uh, presented the P53 knockout, where we knock out the P53 using siRNA, whether they actually can continue growing in the presence of chemotherapy. And we found clearly, you can see these, these cell clusters growing in the control plate, but not in the cisplatin plate with the MK2 gene knocked out the same with paclitaxel. This was something that we could repeat again and again, and we found that it works in cell culture. So then we moved to an animal model, and we, we developed a, a metastatic, high-grade, serous ovarian animal model, which allows us to see these tumors through fluorescence. So the tumors that are generated are generated uh, in the intraperitoneal cavity, uh, and they fluoresce very nicely. We can see them. Uh, because we have uh, them expressing a, a fluorescent protein, green fluorescent protein. So now we can image the tumors in live animals. When we introduce nanoparticles to these tumors, we find that they actually can locate and uh, embed, penetrate into these tumors. So our targeted nanoparticle is working. It's getting into these uh, ovarian uh, metastasis cells, cancer cells from metastasis. And more recently, we found that when we look at treatments with uh, these metastatic tumors, we're getting a very nice sign that this can work. That compared to the control where we're seeing this rapid growth of the tumor, we're seeing that there's already this very slow growth of the tumor in our very early work. So we're excited about this, and we're looking to move this forward 
Uh, we're now looking at more complex models, and we're changing the relative amount and loading of the siRNA that we incorporate. We're also looking at other targets in our work with other collaborators. For example, these are just the names of other cells that are also overexpressed by ovarian cancer and can also be silenced and therefore allow them to be uh, essentially beaten uh, through chemotherapy approaches. And the thing that we're excited about is that we may be able to actually lower the amount of chemotherapy that's needed for these patients as well as the side effects while doing this. So in summary, we can use this kind of layering effect to wrap siRNA over a chemotherapy drug and create combination systems which can allow us to do uh, these kinds of combination therapies. Now, um, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the students who did the work. This is uh, the ovarian cancer team assembled from the Teal Award, and I presented Eric Drayden's work. I also presented Jason Dane's work uh, in our uh, triple negative breast cancer, and uh, I wanted to also acknowledge the great team of collaborators. This is a short list of, of uh, some of the collaborators that I have in the uh, targeted nanoparticle area. Some of my new collaborators are now uh, including some of the speakers today, Angie Belcher and Sangeeta uh, Bhatia, in some of our new uh, work that we're exploring. And uh, I'd like to welcome any questions if we have any. Thank you. So, this sounds very interesting, but at what stage is it as far as getting it out to the public? Very good question. Uh, right now, we're still in the animal stages, uh, and so it is very early stage. In our lab, uh, we actually look at a number of systems, and uh, I described the layer-by-layer -layer system. We have a simple liposomal system that we've been working with, uh, and because liposomal systems have already uh, been used in the body, those are a little bit closer. So depending on which of our material systems we use, we're in different stages. The ones that are in the basic science have greater impact, but the ones that are earlier on, we think we can translate and still make a difference. Like the P53? Is that yes. Yes, absolutely. The P53 is something that, although we're in early stages, um, we are looking at with a huge amount of intensity. Right now, uh, about half of that ovarian research team is uh, working with collaborators at Dana-Farber and at Mass General to look at uh, these, these issues. So it's incredibly important, and um, I, our hope is that we can translate these technologies. And we'll be talking about that, I think, as we move into the round table as well. Yes. Can I ask a question, Paul? <clears throat> so it's, I had two questions. First, in ovarian cancer, some of the problem is dealing with the bulk disease, as Mike Beer described. So I would imagine that for delivery, that's a unique opportunity in ovarian cancer for siRNAs or targeted drugs. So can you comment on that? Yes, uh, in terms of addressing the bulk tumor, uh, one of the things that's interesting is that we can actually combine some of the things we've talked about today, uh, because if we can get genetic information from that primary tumor, uh, and there are technologies being developed that will allow us to get that information faster. We can actually understand what the genetic uh, composition of that tumor is. And from that understanding, we can understand what personalized approach we can use to address the tumor. And I think this is exactly where uh, modern medicine is going in cancer. Uh, and it's one of the reasons why we're excited that there are people like Mike who are looking at the uh, array of genetic differences and understanding these pathways. People like Michael Yaffe and Michael Beer. Michael Yaffe does a systems biology look. Um, we need to look at patients and their genealogies. And this information is what is informing the design of these uh, materials. It's probably worth mentioning that you know siRNA doesn't require you to make a drug and test yes. it for you know, years of development. Absolutely. Once you have one, you've got many. Absolutely. This is one of the beautiful things about this. When you use siRNA, uh, you really are using a platform because once you understand how to deliver it, all of them are the same with respect to their delivery. And as, if you understand the sequence of the gene that you're targeting, you can make that siRNA and implement it. So in personalized medicine, again, if we understand the genetic profile of a given patient, we can then translate that to a treatment very rapidly. 
Hi, thank, thank you, you for your talk. Um, so in terms of the technology itself, what do you think you can deliver rather than SRNA? So I, I don't know, I think that one limit might be the size of what you want to deliver. So with SRNA, that's perfect. But if you think of, I don't know, delivering intrabodies, something else that they can target the proteins rather the, than the RNA, uh, is it possible right now to use these nanoparticles? And another question is, do you think that you can, so in terms of the ligand that you're using to target the cancer, you can use ligands that binds the pump that are speeding up the, um, the pharmaceutical, so you can have a double advantage because you, it's like synergistic effect of binding the pump, so you're blocking the therapy itself and you deliver SIRNA. Excellent, very, very interesting question. So, in the first case, a nanoparticle carrier can actually carry a very broad range of things. Uh, in our own lab, we've looked at chemotherapy drugs, uh, paclitaxel, uh, cisplatin, doxorubicin. We've also looked at inhibitors. So we've looked at a range of uh, uh, erlotinib and a range of other inhibitors. All of these can be incorporated in nanoparticles and actually delivered. And what's interesting is because of the targeting effect of nanoparticles, uh, we can often get the same therapeutic effect at lower doses. In some cases, we've seen factors of four or five lower dose at, for nanoparticle delivery. Uh, and the second, I, I really like that question about whether or not you can also bind up the protein that is doing the, the, the enabling. We want to we get rid of the enablers, right, uh, for these tumor cells. Um, this is something that we're looking at, uh, we, not so much with the MRP pump, but with one of our other approaches in which we're um, looking at binding up a receptor that will allow us to get the drug in, and at the same time, that particular receptor is overexpressed on a number of tumor cells, is also an enabler. Um, it's, a, it's a growth factor receptor that essentially um, uh, enhances the viability, the survivability of these tumor cells uh, through a number of ways, and also enhances the, the ability of those cells to become mobile and metastatic. So we think we can get this one-two punch, depending on what our, our target system is. <laughs> Very exciting and beautiful presentation. I, I wanted to ask you, uh, are you introducing any additional toxicity by the, with the use of nanoparticles? Excellent question. The systems that we're using actually use a number of natural material systems. So our core is a liposome, which is something that has already been approved for uh, chemotherapy use. And then we wrap around the liposome a, um, a series of polysaccharides and sRNA. And chitosan. So these are all chitosan is derived from um, shellfish uh, and is a very common, again, something you can buy in a drugstore or you know so forth. So we're trying to stick to material systems that would naturally be accepted by the body, would break down in the body, or would be enzymatically degradable, something that would, the body would be able to handle and excrete out or break down. Um, so toxicity is a big issue, and you'll you'll hear all of us in nano medicine talking about it. Um, because any foreign material can introduce toxicity in some way or another if introduced in large amount, enough quantities. So it's something that we study. With all of these uh, uh, mouse models, we're also able to look at over time whether we see weight loss. You saw an example of that from uh, Mike Beer's talk. Whether we see inflammation and signs of inflammation, and we do measure those markers in our mice. And so far, we haven't seen those indicators in, in the systems that we're using. Thank you. All right.